千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. In the last few weeks, I have received some questions. So there's one interesting question that I thought、uh, I would bring up with the entire group. So let me go to the slide where the question is at. And as as I am sure、um, people who have been following this broadcast、uh, for some time, you all know. That I respond to questions. I try to answer all the questions.、Uh, I don't、uh, like to avoid anything.、Uh, I want to especially respond to the questions that many people have with a few slides, and that way,、um, that particular question is、uh, responded to, and everyone gets the benefit of、uh, some additional thoughts and discussions. And what I usually do. In responding to a question, is that I start out with the short answer, and then I expand that into a longer answer. So, here is the question that came in a couple weeks back. In the history of ancient China, there have been quite a few tyrants who terrorized or even slaughtered their subjects. How could this be? If the rulers were taught the Tao from a young age, so that was a question, and I thought that there was actually、uh, quite a bit to it. So before I respond to that question, I want to put the question out to the entire group as well and get your initial thoughts on what you think、uh, may be the cause of tyrants from the from the long history of ancient China. It is indeed true. There were many horrible rulers. There were good ones. There were bad ones.、Uh, now, because of the absolute power wielded by the ancient kings and emperors, when they were awful, it could be pretty bad. That many people can lose their lives sometimes for no reason whatsoever, and、uh, definitely abuse, torture.、Um, That's all part of the mix. So, yeah, definitely these ancient rulers、uh, were tutored in the Tao, and having seen the Tao principles yourselves, you know that there's a whole bunch of there's a lot of emphasis on on compassion, on peace,、uh, on love, and there's nothing in the Tao about For instance, killing the infidels. There's nothing in the Tao about you know treating one's enemies harshly,、uh, to salt the earth of a conquered place, things things like that. There's no there's no genocide. There's no cruelty.、Uh, none of that is is in the、uh, is among the teachings of the Tao. So, you know while. Uh, some in the West may say that, well, you know, we have uh, uh, ancient rulers who did not act in a compassionate manner because they pick and choose from the teachings that they got, and they they use that to, to to justify their actions. But what about what about in ancient Chinese history? What were their justifications? So I wanted to throw that out there. See if anyone can come come up with、uh, some speculations as to as to why that is. Now I can see that、uh, a whole bunch of people already are thinking along the same track、uh, that I am in responding to the answer. So、uh, that means the answer that I provide will not take a lot of you by surprise. So. So let's talk about the Tao, the Tao that was taught to the ancients, including the ancient rulers, the kings, and the emperors. 
it's the Tao, and there's a reason for the Tao being called the Tao. It is the path or the way. So one of the unfortunate uh, things about this, as it is with any other discipline or knowledge, is that knowing the path, knowing where the way is leading to, you know, knowing where the, the path is at, that doesn't guarantee anything. It's quite another thing to actually take the path. So the Tao that was taught to the ancient rulers, you know, were taught as a matter of course. But what the individual rulers, the kings and emperors, what they chose to do with what they learned was often a different matter. So I can see that you guys are on the right track. From uh, Barry, Barry uh, contributes that learning the Tao is important, but without daily cultivation, daily practice, that initial power and ability to remain calm during turmoil may make it possible for a person to commit horrendous acts. That's absolutely true. And uh, one more from Tim, humans are humans and those with power, some of them do evil things. It's too easy to interpret things to suit one's purposes. Tim, that is very wise and that's exactly what happened. So to sum up this idea, I find an interesting reference from, uh, from a particular movie, probably everyone recognizes, where the wise one in the movie tells the protagonist that there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. So those of you who have studied the Tao for many years, when you see that quote, you will instantly recognize that it's actually from, from the Tao teachings. So, there's more to the answer, of course, than meets the eyes. Let me make a remark here that the difference, this difference that we're talking about now between knowing the path and walking the path, this is what I would actually point to as the most difficult problem in studying the Tao. So let me uh, expand on that a little bit. The most difficult problem in studying the Tao is the gap between knowing and doing. So you probably all recognize the screen cap, the screen capture that I showed you was from uh, the Matrix movie, which um, the screenwriters for that movie, also the directors, they found that this point was so important, they actually worked it into the script twice. So that instance that you saw, you know, there's a difference between knowing the path and, work, and walking the path, that point was actually made twice in slightly different ways. There is another scene that shows that where the the wise person, the wise role, Morpheus, says to the protagonist, Neo, he says, I can only show you the door, but you're the one who has to walk through it. You must choose to walk through the door. So it's really the same point. It deserves that bit of repetition because it's a problem from ancient times as well as today not just in the emperors, not just uh, among the kings or the movie characters, but also in everyday life. So oftentimes people ask, hey, what are the uh, advanced level teachings of the Tao? I'm positive that my answer to them is a little bit disappointing. What I tell them is that the advanced level of the Tao is the application of the Tao principles. So that is actually quite difficult. If you actually try to apply them in real life in a consistent manner, if you can do it, then that means you've mastered the advanced level. A lot of people can't. A lot of people would only come to the Tao seeking some philosophical ideas, 
to sort of like entertain their mind with. And then after that, they'll set it aside and they will pursue other philosophical ideas. What happens is that they come to enjoy the stimulation of the mind that the Tao can provide. So they will constantly come back to it, seeking new ideas, something they haven't considered before. So that's not really what the Tao is all about. The Tao is about living everyday life, which is why you know the first collection of stories that I put out there is called the Tao of daily life. Daily life may seem boring, but that's where the Tao is at. Uh, other people come to the Tao for different reasons, not necessarily to put Tao principles into practice. So as you guys know, there are many stories in the Tao tradition. So, you know, I enjoy telling these stories, the stories that I have heard since my youth. I enjoy relating them to another group. Uh, I try to, you know, tell these stories in my own way. A lot of times I spent um, spend time in researching the many different versions of the story to try to find the best one. So a lot of these Tao stories have a twist at the end, an unexpected twist at the very end, but not all of them. So some of the stories are constructed like a parable so that at the very end, your task is to compare your own life with the elements from the story so that you will know how to apply it to life. But there's no twist in those particular kinds of stories. A lot of them have a twist ending, but not all of them. So one day, I remember a friend of mine, upon hearing one of the stories that, that doesn't have a twist ending, he says, hey, that, that story it doesn't have a, a Tao kick at the end. So what I responded to him was that, well, the point of the, of the Tao stories, the major point, the main point is not to provide that twist ending. A lot of stories do and they, and that twist ending makes you think, and that's great. But the point is that it's supposed to make you think, supposed to make you contemplate life, but all Tao stories are supposed to make you think and contemplate life regardless. If your primary purpose is to get that twist ending, I told my friend, then you don't really want to study the Tao stories. You want to watch classic episodes of the Twilight Zone. Those will guarantee a twist ending at the end of every episode. So do that instead of listen to Tao stories. I study Tao stories because I want to change my life. Now, for the ancient kings, there is another factor that can be, that can, that we need to take into consideration. And that is, that is the following. As far as teaching and learning the Tao, there's an extra challenge. The extra challenge is that the ideas from the Tao, the concepts, could all be easily twisted. So this is exactly as Tim pointed out. It's too easy to interpret things to suit one's purposes. Those purposes may not be aligned with the Tao. So. I want to provide everyone with some examples of what I have seen. These are not meant to be comprehensive. Uh, there are many other examples where the Tao gets twisted like a pretzel. So, for instance, when learning about the Tao, oftentimes we get exposed to different ways to look at the world and sometimes unconventional ways that there is a difference between looking at the world through conventional ideas and the perspective of the Tao. So oftentimes in the Tao, 
we talk about looking at the world in unconventional ways. Rather than to follow the herd, rather than to follow everyone, because it's possible that everyone is wrong. Now, this is a valuable insight, no doubt about that, in the Tao, but it can be twisted. So someone who decides to twist and distort the Tao can, can say, well, you think I'm wrong, but I'm just looking at the world in an unconventional way. That's what the Tao is all about. So it can be, it can lead to being wrong, but being stubborn about, about being wrong, usually at one's own detriment. So this is just about being contrarian. This is just about uh, that stubbornness, that ego that won't let you give in and admit that you've been wrong and then change your ways. So it can be twisted like that. So another emphasis from the Tao, and especially true uh, since the infusion of Buddhist concepts and Zen Buddhism into the Tao, they become intertwined. And then so in studying the Tao, a lot of times we look at ideas that originated from the Buddhist tradition, the Zen tradition, particularly when it talks about the illusions of the material world, the illusions that lead to one, one's attachments. You know, when you cling and grasp onto the illusions, you are not able to see through them, you become a slave to them. So the Tao talks about seeing through the illusions of the material world. So that is oftentimes the possessions that we prize, the things that we chase after, material things that we chase after, oftentimes they are illusory, they leave you empty at the end. So another valuable teaching, in my opinion, and yet it can be twisted into someone who wants to waste resources, someone who is wasteful, but then justifies the wasteful behavior by saying that, well, you know, these material things, they're illusory anyway. So, you know, you say that I am wasting, but in reality, I'm wasting nothing. Ha ha ha. So that's yet another way that I have seen people, another excuse that I have seen people come up with to justify behavior that's not necessarily in accordance with the Tao. Finally, and the big one, is that in the Tao, we talk about flowing freely, go with the flow, and recognize artificial constraints as what they are, and don't be tied down, don't be bound by artificial constraints, you want to attain a degree of spiritual freedom to be able to see that so you can determine your actions because you're sovereign, because you are, you have the last word on your own destiny. So that freedom, that spiritual freedom can be twisted also. So this is, uh, this is actually a big thing. I see this maybe more often than anything else. Uh, in the West as well as, uh, as in Asia. That freedom gets twisted into, I get to do whatever I want, whenever I want. So, in fact, all of these twists and distortions had been problems in ancient times. When rulers wanted to justify their actions, they would twist what they had learned into into something that sounds rational, but is really just an excuse. Especially the last one, then it, it sort of gave people license that, oh, well, you know, I'm free, I'm not constrained by that. So it got to be pretty bad, and letting things flow could uh, be twisted to get in the way of making productive progress. So it all became too much. So because of these actual genuine problems in the early days of the Chinese dynasties, it was eventually decided 
that there had to be a change. So initially, after the time of Laozi, without a doubt, imperial traditions dictated that the teachings of the Tao should be taught to, to the royals, to the imperials. So as the young princes are growing up, one of the, the great, one of the necessary elements of their education was the, the Tao teachings, the Tao Te Ching and the principles, everything like that. This resulted in not very good outcomes because of the twisting and distortion that I just mentioned. So centuries after the time of Laozi, it had to change. People realized that they had to switch away from the Tao teachings to a more Confucian focus. And this was by necessity. Now, in going with Confucius, I want to be very cautious here to let everyone know that the ancients did not think of themselves as getting away from the Tao to its diametric opposite, the Confucian teachings. No, that's not the case. That is a misconception from today's academics in some academic circles. So the idea back in those days was that Confucius, what he taught, the principles that he advocated, they were all from the Tao as well. The difference between Confucius and Laozi was that whereas Laozi would advocate, well, you know, do less, you know, be free, you know, break free of striving to get something done, full of attachments that you trip over yourself, all that good stuff that Lao Tzu talks about. The emphasis of Confucius drawing from the same tradition of Tao teachings, his emphasis was different. His emphasis was, well, here are the rules that we must follow derived from the ancient teachings of the Tao. So to the, to the, uh, to the Chinese scholars responsible for the education of a future king of emperor, these were all variations on the same theme, and the same theme is the Tao. They just wanted a more, a more delineated, a clearer and defined way to go about practicing the Tao, and that was Confucius. So Confucian teachings, definitely a lot of emphasis on etiquette, a lot of em emphasis on proper behavior, different levels. You need to behave a certain way toward a certain level, whether higher or lower, and so on. So ever since that time, centuries after the time of Laozi, for more than, uh, for more than a thousand years, uh, the Confucian teaching held to sway in the imperial courts. And then later on, as Buddhism became popular, it was tempered with elements from Buddhism as well. Now, after that change, things improved somewhat due to the clear focus and etiquette of, of conduct, but the fundamental problem was never resolved. The fundamental problem was you can, you can lead a horse to water, but not make a drink. You can show someone the door, but they have to walk through it. You can explain the way or the path, but they have to decide to take the path. They have to, to go on the way themselves. In other words, the gap between knowing and doing, that fundamental problem was never resolved. And it, it was that fundamental issue that, that caused some of the emperors to have what they felt was license and excuse to do whatever they wanted. They can disregard, they can justify, you know, they can sound pretty good. So adding to this, the factor that monarchy, absolute rulers that inherit their power from one generation to the next in a dynasty, that you know that would never be a meritocracy because it's, you know, father passing the 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 throne to the son you know whichever son it happens to be to ascend to the throne well that per
person inheriting the throne, you know, is not necessarily the best person for the job. You can do everything possible to train that person, to make that person the best, you know, that he can be, but you cannot guarantee that it's the best person taking the throne. That's why you end up with a mixed bag. Some rulers were great, others, not so much. Here, it's important to point out that the emperors, the rulers, they were people too. They were human beings, just like, just like you and me. And power has a predictable effect on human beings. You already know where I'm going with this. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's uh, well from the uh, from examples from Chinese history, uh, power did not corrupt absolutely, but it did corrupt in a majority of cases. So it is possible, and it's to the credit of the scholars who taught some of these great emperors and kings, you know, from childhood to follow the Tao. It's to their credit that they ended up with the pupil who became king or emperor who did not fall prey to the corrupting influence of power. That there were as many great, uh, compassionate uh, kings and emperors, uh, that's actually quite an accomplishment. It's just that it could not be consistent, it could not be sustained. So before we leave the slide, one last point to reiterate to everyone, you've heard me talk about this before, but I want to caution everyone against a romanticized version of ancient China. It's very easy for us to hear and talk about these stories from ancient China and end up with this romanticized version. And indeed, there are, I'm, I'm positive, there are many people listening to me today who have a romanticized idea of China in modern times. Well, first of all, humans are humans, to quote Tim once again, people are the same pretty much everywhere. There's astonishing good and bad in every corner of the globe and pretty much in even distribution everywhere. So if you are sick and tired of all the horrible people here and you travel there, well, you're gonna find, you're gonna discover the same horrible people there as well, in some cases even more so. So I keep trying to tell people to not romanticize China, either in ancient times or modern times, but usually what I say fall on deaf ears. <laughs> so in the context of this question, uh, yeah, the ancient Chinese did not handle power any better than their Western counterparts. So they could also be easily corrupted. They could also be quite heinous in their actions. So that's something that I want to continue to emphasize in the days ahead. And that's it for the, for the Q&A on that. I think you have probably more than enough insights on the question, you know, how is it that some of these ancient, ancient rulers were so horrible? Well, they were because they learned the Tao, but they did not necessarily apply the Tao. They, uh, they, they wielded absolute power and it was easy to, to be corrupted by that power. And, uh, you know, as you can, as you can see here, there, there are just so many factors. The Tao could be so easily twisted into something it was never meant to be. So uh, Sam makes a great point that these ancient rulers, just because they were sovereign over a kingdom or an empire, that didn't mean that they were sovereign over their own ego. That is by far the more difficult problem. Ruling the country is one thing, ruling oneself is quite another. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, 
May the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.